All right, good afternoon or good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us today on for our webinar on building value in ROI in housing and health partnerships. Um, today we're going to have a special guest. Uh, his name is Kevin Lombardi. And first we're gonna go over a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. Uh, first, all participants are muted upon entry. If you have any questions or any comments, please make sure that you engage in the chat. Raise your hand if you would like to unmute. The meeting is also being recorded and the slides and recording link will be sent via email. So these are also just another um, more detailed instructions about uh, Zoom. Uh, you, can, um, you can mute and unmute yourself by pressing the mic button at the bottom left of your screen. To turn your video on and off, please press the, com the cam recorder icon and then click the chat button, the chat bubble in order to share your comments or questions for the group. We'll also be using a simple tool called, we're not gonna be using any um, Mentimeter uh, tools today, but we are going to be doing a few poll questions. And also we'll be sharing um, all the information or any slides and um, also PDF files via email after today's webinar. Uh, this is just some information about the National Center for Health and Public Housing. The mission of NCHP, NCHPH is to strengthen the capacity of public housing primary care grantees and other health center grantees by providing training and a range of technical assistance. NCHPH is also a project supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration and is, national, and is a national training and technical assistance partner and is 100% financed by this grant. The information presented today are those of the author. So in case you didn't know, um, this is just some information about the health centers that are close to public housing. So as of 2021 health center data, there were 1,373 federally qualified health centers serving 30 million patients. Also, there were 458 FQHCs that are in and immediately accessible to public housing serving 5.7 million patients. And of those 458 FQHCs, 108 are from public housing primary care serving approximately 911,000 patients. And then in terms of public housing demographics information, um, according to HUD 2022 data, 1.5 million, there are 1.5 million residents in public housing with two persons per household, 38% that are disabled, 52% that are white, 43% that are African-American, 26% that are from Latinx, and 19% that are elderly, 36% that are children, and also 91% that are low income with 32% female headed households with children. So now I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Kevin Lombardi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for your service and thank you for your time today as we go over this uh, exciting and important subject. Uh, so just to briefly go over these learning objectives, which I'm now seeing I numbered as one um, for each of them, but they're all important. So it makes sense. Uh, identify, we're going to be identifying the key elements for optimal partnerships between housing and healthcare providers. Um, for those of you who come from centers who, that are not around or accessible to housing, uh, the, uh, the way we design this program will be easy to port to other um, relationships as well. Uh, we'll be describing the value of building cross-sector partnerships and the methods for implementation. Uh, specifically, we'll be going over two methods for implementation that you could use in your own practice that allow a step-by-step -step and a quantitative approach to creating, evaluating, and maintaining uh, partnerships. Uh, and also uh, understanding the concept of social return on investment and its applications for community partnerships. Um, next slide, please, Peter. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, so uh, just a couple of poll questions for us uh, so we get an understanding of what our group is. Uh, and uh, first one is, do you have an existing partnership with a health center, public housing agency, or community organization at your um, at your center. And Fide, uh, you know how to do the, the clicking, so you can actually take over. Sorry. 
No problem, thank you. So we're gonna provide about 30 seconds for everybody to give their responses. Peter, will we will be will we be able to see that live as the answer? Yep. Okay, so here are the results and 67% said yes, they currently have an existing partnership and 33% said no. And you can go on to the next question. Is your health center actively considering a new partnership? Um, put yes, no, or not applicable. If Okay, thank you everyone for your responses. And 55% said yes, they are actively considering a new partnership. 9% said no, and 36% said not applicable. Well, exciting. Um, the, uh, today we'll be going over tools that you can integrate into your partnership processes. I'll also be distributing the, uh, some publications and details regarding how to do it. Uh, there are multiple different validated ways of uh, creating partnerships and evaluating them, and uh, you should consider both if you're looking to try a new method. Uh, for those of you who aren't connected to housing, uh, this method, these methods can also be applied to really any partnerships. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, just some quick introductions. Uh, I'm Dr. Kevin Lombardi. Uh, my background is as, as an internal medicine physician and epidemiologist, uh, and my research background is in the, primarily the social determinants of health and uh, medical protocol compliance. That's yeah. me in 1992 getting my hair cut. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. And my name is Philip Pineda Sandoval, and I am the training and technical assistance manager at National Center for Health and Public Housing. And here at NCHPH, I provide analytical, technical, and logistical support to the team. Um, and my background is also in public health and also working in uh, various clinics here in Northern Virginia. I'm currently pursuing my MPH, and that is a little bit about my background. And that picture is of me back in Honduras, where I'm originally from. Okay, just, just some info before we go right into the tools. The World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Poverty uh, has a disproportionate impact on individuals' health, and conditions associated with impoverished social environment result in uh, severe negative health outcomes, as uh, I'm sure you all know from your own work. Housing and health are human rights, interdependent, and any infringement on these rights severely impacts the most vulnerable in our society, including the elderly, communities of color, youth, families with children, those who are transgender or gender nonconforming, veterans, and persons with disabilities. A national crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic, economic turmoil uh, due to inflation, uh, or other social or economic issues compounds the social economic stressors uh, experienced by this population, resulting in a disproportionate impact on their health, often resulting in unemployment and corresponding increase in housing instability and homelessness. Uh, this lecture is designed for health centers administering the Health Services for Public Housing Residents Program, Section 330I, as well as other health centers serving residents of public housing. Uh, we'll be providing information, resources, and references to enable community health center staff, public health agency staff, and residents to understand the services, uh, increase the understanding of HUD subsidized uh, programs, and get a good bearing on the types of tools and evaluative measures that are uh, professional standards for, uh, for creating partnerships and maintaining partnerships. Uh, next slide, slide please. 
So um, all of you, it seems like a good proportion of you are either in a relationship already with an outside organization or are considering it. Um, so the reasons for, par for partnerships can be, are as vast as the diversity that we see in our health centers and populations. But um, before you create a partnership and before we access the tools, having a well-defined reason for the partnership is extremely important. And the conception of that leadership should, uh, that uh, the reason for that partnership should be shared by all the stakeholders. Um, uh, at times, uh, even a small difference in understanding why the partnership is being, uh, is being pursued uh, can lead to issues, disagreements, and um, uh, difficulties down the road. Uh, next, please. There are a lot of benefits to creating programming, uh, program partnerships, improved delivery of programming, increased use of programs and resources, more efficient use of programs, uh, opportunities for your staff for professional development, um, elimination of duplication of services between different organizations, uh, improved communication and increased availability of resources. Uh, improved public image is, is a big and important part of this as well. Uh, barriers to uh, partnerships include turf issues and turf mentality, uh, lack of staff resources uh, to participate in the collaboration. They do take time, the communication in particular. Conflicts with organizational focus, uh, mistrust, uh, slow decision making, and it decreased levels of cooperation among collaborators during crisis. Next one, please. This is just a model for collaborating. Uh, I'll be sharing the slides and the uh, associated documents, by the way, after the lecture. Uh, next one, please. So uh, first we'll be going over a uh, conceptual model for building and evaluating partnerships. I like to think of this as a procedure. Uh, the uh, oftentimes following a procedure and making sure the steps are followed appropriately can be time consuming, but um, uh, has benefits down the road as far as making sure the collaboration is designed responsibly, the stakeholders are appropriately involved, and that evaluated, evaluation tools are decided before. The, uh, the partnership begins. So uh, we'll be breaking this up into five uh, different steps, uh, all of which will be covered in detail with, um, with examples in the documents I'll be uh, distributing to all of you. Uh, but we'll be starting it with this, building a medical neighborhood and understanding the concept of a medical neighborhood, defining the level of partnership that meets your needs, evaluating barriers to partnership, and importantly, how to maintain those relationships and perhaps most importantly, how to responsibly evaluate those relationships. Next, please. That's you, Pete. Uh, Fide, you, you're mute, you're muted. Thank you so much, sorry about that. Um, so here we have some information about building your neighborhood, um, and we have a few steps about how to build these partnerships to understand what possibilities there are. So um, a medical neighborhood is a clinical community partnership that includes the medical and social support supports necessary to enhance health with the patient-centered medical home, serving as the patient's primary hub and coordinator of healthcare delivery. The goals of a high-functioning PCMH, or patient-centered medical home, include collaborating with these various medical neighbors to encourage the flow of information across and between clinicians and patients to include specialists, hospitals, home health, long-term care, and other clinical providers as well. So these medical neighborhood maps, um, they can take a, a variety of forms, but should be memorialized in written format so that all members of the health center care team can identify neighbor organizations and link patients to community resources. So medical neighborhood maps could be uh, circle diagrams with the patient population in the center and partners listed on spoke, Excel list of partners with relevant contact information noted on patient care plans in the EHR, a bulletin board in the health center. 
By identifying and partnering with community organizations, health centers can support patients in accessing resources that advance health outcomes outside of the health center walls and health center staff can also begin the process of identifying medical neighbors by one, creating care maps for patients and populations. Um, and, care, and, a, and a care map is a comprehensive snapshot of the medical and social supports in place to promote patient and family wellness. Care maps should be created in consultation with patients and families with the patient population at the center. And the map should also change, be changed based on evolving patient needs and should incorporate all of the social determinants of health at play in a patient's life. And two, identifying the community organizations that play a role in patient population care maps. Um, by doing this, you identify a point of contact at the organization, and you're also able to create a contingency plan for turnover. And lastly, operationalize partnership by creating a shared protocol memorandum of understanding. So here I, I had uh, the, the, an example of uh, in New Jersey of a medical map that was created by an organization there. Uh, this is an important step of really understanding where you are, even if you have a good understanding of the organizations in your area that may be suitable for partnerships, uh, going through the process of mapping them and putting them on an, either an Excel sheet or a diagram uh, is a good way of communicating the, what the environment is to your staff and to your patients. Uh, and it's also a great way to uh, find things that you may have missed through thinking of who might be an appropriate partner. We all have biases when we're considering partnerships and creating a map and creating lists allows a, a more egalitarian focus on what might be appropriate and what might not be appropriate. And it provides a medium for conversation between colleagues and what may or may not be appropriate. Um, and by the way, the steps for this in more detail will be in the PDF. Uh, next, please. All right, so this is information about levels of partnerships. So organizations that are committed to improving the health of uh, their community can support collective action through the formation of a partnership. And not all partnerships look the same and often can develop over time with increased capacity and levels of support. So there are benefits to organizations involved at any of the following stages. As shown in the slide, we have networking, information sharing between groups, coordinating, aligning activities to meet a common goal, cooperating, sharing resources or space through a written contract, and collaborating, which involves enhancing capacities through seeking mutual feedback. You know, Fida, the way that I like to think of this um, is when considering partnerships and trying to conceptualize it. Uh, is it's it, think of a health center as kind of like a person and all of the potential partnerships as some as different people who you could engage into your social network. Uh, as we know, our social networks are important for our social lives and our professional lives. And that's the same with an organization. Uh, these networks don't, ne these collaborations don't need to be large programs or multi-million dollar collaborations. Even something small like a uh, agreement to communicate about certain things or an agreement to share resources under stress or during emergencies are appropriate for, uh, appropriate steps, uh, first steps in creating partnerships and building trust with other organizations. Just like when you're building a relationship with a person, uh, building relationships between different agencies uh, takes time. And trust is not a given, just like when you meet someone, it's not an assumption always. And building that can, lead to some pretty fabulous results. Uh, next slide, please. So barriers to partnership. The next step is identifying with these are in your certain particular partnership that you're considering. So to be clear, you have a map, you have uh, identified what kind of partnership you want. And at this point you're thinking, well, what are the issues that may come up that may prevent that? Um, barriers to partner, encountering barriers on your way to having a productive and meaningful uh, partnership is, is common and recommended. Uh, roadblocks to effective partnerships may not be obvious until they're written down and understood. And these are things that are worth thinking through because when they, they do pop up down the road and you've invested resources, time, and money into starting uh, communication and considering a relationship, uh, it can prevent it essentially makes the process more efficient. 
uh, and extremely important to obje objectifying the process and making sure that uh, it's done appropriately and your resources are used appropriate, appropriately, uh, with time being an important resource as well. Uh, next, please. So you've created a partnership. Maintaining partnerships are the next step. Uh, and this is, again, uh, kind of like having a, a, a friend or a colleague that you maintain a relationship with. Uh, once organizations are on board for a, for a partnership, there should be very clear ground rules and standards of conduct, meeting frequency, and task man management. And these don't need to be terribly formal. Uh, it could be via email or being a what I would recommend is a memorandum of understanding between organizations that just puts that on paper and understanding. So uh, there are no confusions as to how communication will be done and uh, what is appropriate. Those are two of the things that come up as issues in partnerships, the most common. Different cultures of communication, different experiences in communication, and different expectations. Making sure you get that on paper is important, not just for the uh, it, for your organization and making sure you get use out of a partnership, but in maintaining and growing those relationships. Uh, while all members can play an important role, it will be helpful, helpful to identify and maintain a core leader or leadership team to keep track of goals. Those in a leadership role should be committed to navigating a group through, cha through changes, uh, identifying future projects, and potential collaborations. Aiming for multiple sources of financial support can allow partnerships to secure sufficient funding that is sustainable over time. And if both organization has both organizations have appointed someone to lead that uh, interagency partnership, uh, the extra minds are very helpful in finding ways to collect funding and find funding. Uh, organizations have very different sources of fund funding at times, other than their the it's, it's especially the small things that go to new programs. And uh, bringing those, that's an extremely important part of the, the partnership. It does give you access to more information and more possibilities. Um, health center patients should be informed that, a pop, that partnership services are available. Um, and it, it may be feasible to provide information directly through your EHR, depending on what your system uses. Now, this is much easier said than done. Uh, HIPAA compliant data transfer is a consistent issue with partnerships. Uh, what I will say is there are some technologies coming down the pipeline that will ease that, um, encryption technologies and so forth. You should expect those to be available within the next three, three years or so. But also um, looking at the possibility of what EHR uh, data can be share, shared and uh, what your partners can share is a very important part of any medical partnership that you may have. Uh, maintaining healthy partnerships requires conflict to be addressed in a prompt and direct manner. Uh, and conflicts will happen. Uh, it's very strange to see a, a relationship that's lasted a while and there has not been a, some sort of conflict, even a small one. Um, leaders may need to embrace the initial discomfort of talking through that. Um, depending on the size of the group, opportunities for feedback may be um, approached with more casual tasks. A willingness to revisit approach and make necessary changes will allow the group to continue to effectively work towards your agreed upon goals. I can't emphasize enough how important the communication is here. Uh, employee turnover and other staffing changes are things that I think all of us are dealing with now. Maintaining that communication is an important way of doing that. If you're gonna be appointing someone as a leader for a partnership, my recommendation is to make sure that that person has, uh, isn't on their way out or that you're clear about um, how long they would do that. Partnerships are kind of like a plant or an animal that you need to nurture and take care of. During the initial stages of a collaborative relationship, it's important for organizations involved to clearly define their roles. Um, and those are likely often different because of the different strengths and uh, weaknesses of the organizations. Distributing responsibilities in a way that's responsible and realistic uh, through communication and through your memorandum of understanding uh, makes it clear what is achievable and what everyone wants and what the potential barriers are. I'm discussing this hypothetical with the understanding that the organization uh, and who you would be partnering with is also going through a similar process or thinking through it in a stepwise fashion. Um, 
Common goals often that spark a partnership can help to shape a way a group talks about its mission and approach amongst each other in a larger community. A commitment to staying engaged in the collective work will ensure partnership can be maintained for the long term. Uh, next, please. Evaluating partnership. Uh, this is the part that's often missed and often not done. Um, in my opinion, you cannot responsibly uh, engage in a partnership without having an agreed upon evaluation method. Uh, and if you're not using evaluation methods for all of your programs in uh, at your center, I I'd recommend giving it a try, um, being able to find ways to objectify information and share information uh, about your partnerships and about your programs can lead to a, some in, increased efficiency and increased uh, uh, efficiency, particularly in use of financial resources. Uh, so there are several approaches to doing this. Um, and that kind of depends on the level of resources and the stakeholder expectations that have been, in, that have been discussed. Some important things to ask, uh, who is the evaluation for? What are the priorities? What do they want to know? What targets uh, does the partnership want to reach? And when do you want to reach those targets? Formal evaluators will be able to look at a partnership's progress over time if clear objectives have been de developed and if those are involved in the work. Um, that allows you to look at the partnership objectively during the process of creating and implementing a shared program in a way that's subjective and fair. Uh, the evaluation of a partnership uh, focused on better health outcomes for a specific community will not provide sole credit for a long-term positive change that occurs in the target population, particularly if there are other organizations working towards a similar goal. However, this does not detract from a collaboration's positive contribution, and an evaluation can help identify the most effective short-term efforts that were made. Uh, the results of this evaluation should be shared with all groups and stakeholders represented and interested in the collaboration um, and should be considered when uh, evaluating the possibility for any future collaborations with that organization or when you're creating new partnerships or considering new partnerships. Next, please. So, uh, case study. Um, this is quite lengthy. Uh, I have two case studies that are going to be in the slides. What I would recommend is uh, if you're interested in looking at the details of how uh, or a, a couple of organizations have created extensive partnerships, uh, the, uh, the notes of my slides have all the details and the documents have all the details of these particular uh, uh, partnerships. Um, so uh, the first that's available in the documentation is a um, is a partnership between a community health center in um, uh, in uh, in Ohio and their uh, local housing authority, and a second uh, between um, the uh, city of Los Angeles and a um, a local health center there. And two ahead, please. So now we'll be stepping through our toolkit. If you're gonna go, this is a, a, a different way. This is a new tool, new steps, new tool. We've gone over one, we're doing the second. Uh, this is an approach that I prefer because it's more compartmentalized and, um, and, and it, it works for the way that I think. It's important when you're talking about this to, uh, to talk about what system you're going to use before you start using it. But um, anyway, uh, next slide. There's not, this is just what you would fill out in the beginning. Um, so social return on investment is something that you should count that I would recommend calculating when, when you're evaluating your program. Uh, it's an analysis of how much positive impact is created by an organization translated into a dollar to dollar value. Um, now, uh, I, there, there are folks that are uncomfortable objectifying partnerships and putting a dollar value on those partnerships. Uh, and there's a there's no objective way to certainly do that. A lot of times the value we're putting towards different services are assumed or, um, or are estimated, but um, it's an important part of the process. And one, looking at the different steps and understanding how they would be evaluated and how much, if it was put to a 
dollar value a partnership could have and a program could have. Um, and it's an important part of, uh, of moving your program advancement forward. Uh, if you're evaluating your programs and creating an objective number, this is a calculation, uh, it allows you to compare programs and it allows you to report information to your board of directors, to your community in a way that's fairly easy to understand. Next step, please. Next slide, please. So why measure SROI? Uh, and, and just to be clear again, the, the uh, details regarding this calculation, how to perform it, recommendations and examples will be in the, the documentation that I'll be sending to you. Um, so uh, identifying successes and gaps in programming, improving services and staffing and generating reports for funders and boards. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important that is, um, it, particularly for, for the funding and particularly for your board of directors. Next step, please. Um, just the step, uh, next one after that too. So uh, how do you measure SOR? So uh, there is a, in the information I'll be distributing, there are blank copies of this that you can go through. Um, and it's a very useful tool, very easy. Um, and it's a good way to conceptualize the program evaluation process in a way that could lead to insight, even if um, the, the number you get doesn't make much sense. Uh, the, the benefit is, is in the process. Um, so I, identifying the stakeholders. Um, so list the stakeholders and decide which stakeholders are relevant. Um, and it, at times it takes multiple minds together to, to think of all the stakeholders that, that there could be, um, but getting that on paper is the first step. Next. So uh, next is create an impact map, map. Identify the inputs and evaluating inputs including the non-monetizing inputs such as uh, volunteers or in-kind contributions. Um, and identifying the outputs and outputs of the program initiative. Uh, here's an example here um, of a luncheon club. Uh, and there's some more examples in the PDFs I'll be, I'll be sending out uh, to take a look at that. Next. So next, uh, how, in, in how to measure SRI is identifying the unique indicators to match uh, the outcomes, uh, gather, gathering stake holder input to understand the social outcomes like reduce social isolation. Stakeholder input should always be a part of your program evaluation, be that members of your community, members of your board, members of your uh, volunteer staff or employees. The identified stakeholders should be involved in the process, both in the, both in the evaluation and most importantly in reviewing the data and its implications. Next, please. So here's where we start putting numbers on things, uh, providing value for each outcome. And this will be clear when you're going through the boxes. Um, this can be difficult at time if you're looking at say volunteers, monetizing it, but getting an agreed upon number between your colleagues and, uh, and, and putting something together is, is relatively um, easy if you put your minds together. Uh, and here, a couple of, different ways to do it. The details regarding these will be in the PDF. Next, please. Um, deadweight adjustment, how much of the change outcomes is related to the program and the attribution rate. Next. So at the end of working through these steps, going through these boxes, uh, you'll have uh, monetary value numbers that are given. And this uh, very simple equation will give you a number. Uh, that you can report to your stakeholders, that you can um, uh, report to your board of directors, and so forth. Okay, it looks like we did this pretty quick, so I'm going to quickly go over the resources and then go back to the case studies and go through those. Um, but uh, these are very detailed, I mean very detailed step-by-step -step guides on how to do a social return on investment, if it's something you're interested in or you think might be appropriate. Um, and uh, the links are here and uh, you'll be getting my slides and access that if you'd like to. Um, next, please. I'll also be distributing, uh, oh, sorry, next, please, after that. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll also be distributing these two PDFs. Uh, they're fairly lengthy, but um, uh, are very clear 
and how to step-by-step -step way of deciding what type of partnerships are appropriate for you, identifying organizations, and um, the process of creating, maintaining, evaluating those partnerships. And let's go back up to the first case and I'll, I'll read through that. That's number 19. Fabulous. First case study is embedding community health workers in public housing, a place based uh, approach to health. Uh, the uh, community health workers, I, th I think we've all had an experience of uh, having difficulty funding community health workers and finding ways to fund them because they're non-reimbursable in many cases. Uh, for uh, community health workers have a range of positive impacts on communities and the organization. Uh, at times though, it's difficult to monetize and really even understand these because uh, of the subtle impact that it can have. Uh, a, a constituent center that we, that we see, uh, uh, that I speak to frequently uh, in Chicago uh, has, has been measuring this and found a way to measure this and saw that community health workers, just having them doing their work in the building uh, actually led to better job satisfaction in physicians, behavioral health workers, and their nursing staff. Uh, so it, it's difficult to put a monetary value on that, but that's a, we're all having staffing issues. Uh, community health workers can help with your, your retention. Uh, so uh, I digress. So. Um, a place-based approach to health is a, uh, a program launched on, in 2019. It's a pilot that has since finished and been published. Um, so the, the point is cre to create job opportunities for residents of public housing as community health workers and to assess the benefits of embedding community health workers within their own public housing communities to provide peer-to-peer -peer support for, uh, for health and social needs. Um, so I've never engaged with a program like this in the United States, but I, I have implemented a very similar one in, in Haiti. And uh, I, I, I've had very positive experiences with finding members of the community for community health workers and uh, using them to, to access and support the community. Uh, it's an efficient way to, to support your community and empower your community. Uh, this program aims to develop develop like a, a new position that is informed by existing CHW models, but embeds them in the community. Uh, and this was done in Ohio. We'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, could we go to slide 20? Slide 20. Was that what we were just on? We were in 22. Okay, uh, slide 20, please. 20. Oh, my numbers are different than yours. Uh, the uh, developing cross sector, uh, go down one. Yes, okay. So uh, this describes a 20 million public and private partnership between Olivia Medical Center and FQHC in Chicago, um, a nonprofit community development corporation, as well as the city of Chicago. Uh, the three organizations work together to create uh, can you pronounce this, Peter? Um, um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to butcher it publicly. Um, Alivia Medical Center? Maravilla, Maravilla. Casa Maravilla? Yeah, is that it? Okay, yes. Uh, so it, it is, in, in addition to being something that I pronounce badly, is a 7,000 square foot senior housing building in Chicago's uh, Pilsen neighborhood. It has 73 in independent apartments for adults age 55 and older. Um, so the genesis of the relationship between the organizations began when community activists realized that the population in the community was aging and that there was no affordable housing options for, for seniors. The Resurrection Pro the Project, a nonprofit community development corporation, was interested in building a, a development that anchored the community to fend off gentrification as much as possible. They approached the CEO of the medical center, the community health center to purchase some of this land north of the medical center. 
and Olivio agreed with one condition that some of the land was reserved for a senior building with a senior center. Um, again, setting priorities and communicating those early on. The resurrection, resurrection process uh, project contacted the city of Chicago's Department of Family Support Services Senior Area Agency on a aging to discuss creating a satellite senior center. Uh, since Olivia was experiencing um, was experienced in providing healthcare to seniors, the project asked them to manage the site. And here we're seeing a, a, a pretty pretty clear um, uh, sharing of resources, but also sharing of expertise. We have a health center that treats the elderly, particular it, 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 it has a disproportionate patient population that is elderly and an organization that's focused on them. Um, so the, re, uh, the Resurrection Project owns the building and they lease part of the first floor to the city of Chicago for the senior center at no cost. Olivio Medical Center manages the senior center at no cost. The unique public and private partnership has extended care to over 6,000 seniors in that area. The senior center has month a monthly wellness program, a nurse, a registered dietitian, and a pharmacist to provide a pharmacist at the site. The senior center center also operates as a benefits enrollment center to help people with SNAP, Medicare, uh, Medicaid, uh, and and other uh, relevant programs. Uh, they also work with local school programs to allow students to work or volunteer at the senior center, which is beneficial for both age groups. Um, so the evaluation of this program. The partners routinely evaluated the quality of care delivered to the seniors in the community and strive to improve it wherever it was possible. And it's kind of difficult to decide where to improve things if you're not evaluating and the key and core aspects of the evaluation process. But one of the unique characteristics of the community was its diversity. The area is multilingual, multicultural, and the staff at the senior center has evolved to reflect those changes. Uh, agencies that serve limited English speakers must have appropriate staff to provide culturally competent care, as I'm sure you all know, beyond just the translation. And the translation, of course, is a civil rights issue uh, that I'm sure we all take very seriously. Uh, the cast, the, the staff of the, um, of the senior center isn't, isn't just bilingual, but it's bicultural. Uh, these are two often very different things. One of the challenges for seniors served at this uh, senior center has been misinformation. Seniors are often unaware of the programs and services with, that they're eligible for at the center. Therefore, through funding through the National Counseling on Aging, uh, they now they started screening and identifying programs uh, that up to 2000 seniors can use to solve this program that was identified in their evaluation. Benefits of Benefits of the partnerships have extended beyond those served direct, directly just as the senior center. It's also enriched the community by connecting an aging population with youth, which has a very positive effect on, um, on the uh, mental health and the physical health of this population. Uh, students from neighboring schools spend time at the facility as interns, externs, and volunteers. Uh, it, it really turned into a, an engine for develop, development within the community. According to the director, um, it, it was a, a remarkable experience and it enabled them to talk to people in the community and young people that they wouldn't normally have exposure to. And importantly, it allowed them to pull more, more, uh, more patients into their system and enroll more patients into their system because of the outreach and their ability to sign them up for appropriate insurance programs at the center. Uh, benefits of the partnerships, have, uh, excuse me, so uh, this is a, a growing uh, or a growing program, and uh, stakeholders involved engage in yearly uh, evaluations and uh, decide if they're going to invest more. Um, uh, my understanding at last was the uh, there was an additional fifteen million dollar uh, addition that was uh, uh, that grant fund funding was secured for, and it's been expanded. The evaluation process was a very important part of getting that funding, uh, being able to tell grant providers, donors, and so forth, that there is not just a, a subjective uh, benefit to the community, but also an ob a objective measurable me uh, impact on the community is very important. The subjective information adds color and the objective information adds structure. It's very effective in 
convincing those who may be interested in funding your sender that your, your program is appropriate. Uh, it's also a good way to just be really honest and upfront about what expectations are. Um, if donors are able to see your data, your information, and to uh, understand how, how your program has been evaluated in the past, it, it adds integrity to it and it adds a lot of um, trust. Uh, in particular, if you've been engaging in an appropriate number of evaluations and you have a clear, uh, like this center, a clear process that has been, been engaged with where a program was defined, it was started and created, and, and there were regular assessments and regular evaluations as decided between the, um, the partners, that's a very powerful group of data to get, um, get funding, but also to inform your constituents and stakeholders that programs are being appropriately managed, uh, that they're effective. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's interesting information regardless. Um, Afide, do I still have you? Yep, I'm still here. Okay. Um, so that's it. We wrapped up a little quick, a little quick. So we'll um, spend the last ten minutes or so on uh, questions, or if there are any. If there aren't any, um, I will ask my own. Um, and if we could get hands for this, could any of you who have a a uh, a program or collaboration that you're considering or have implemented uh, that you would like to share with us? Uh, I'd be very appreciative and. Um, Fide, can you explain to them how to raise their hand if they're interested? Sure, yeah. If um, you would like to, oh, we already have one hand raised, um, so I'm going to allow for you to talk. Yeah, okay, great. And I will be taking notes on this. Hi, Sandy. Hi, my name is Sandy Festa. I'm the executive director of, uh, I can't turn my camera on, I don't think, um, of a uh, federally called. That's great of a federally qualified health center in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Um, and um, we started out as a healthcare for the homeless and now um, have all comers. Um, I've worked at the larger organization for 34 years, so I've had a lot of experience. Um, and one was um, old uh, OSAP and CSAP grants for working in public housing. And there was a lot of movement in, um, you know, doing drug treatment in public housing before, and then the funding ended. So when I came back to be the executive director of our federally qualified health center, I was very committed to working in public housing. So we opened a health center without any additional funding, and it's been struggling for me um, not to have some additional seed money. Um, uh, about 800 seniors live in a three block radius. Um, and some of the, uh, you know, the political leaders call it a healthcare desert, uh, which moved me as a social worker and our, our health center to do something about it. Um, I'm hoping HRSA eventually comes out with some new money um, for some site support. Um, and I'll answer any questions that you may have about it. We've been doing some hotspotting. We know higher ER utilization, admission and readmission are coming from those areas. Mm. Okay, uh, so this is a, a significant burden. Um, so with your particular funding situation, uh, I, I've been talking to centers throughout the country, and this is a very common issue right now uh, because so much of that funding is uh, is elapsing. Uh, centers who have created programs uh, within the last couple of years in particular are now having to perhaps make a decision to invest a lot of time, resources, and personnel in finding funding or paring back their program offerings, which is an incredibly stressful uh, position to be in. Sure. Um, as someone who knows, understands, and cares about your community and knows what impact that would be. Uh, so question for you, um, have you considered or engaged in any evaluations of your programs as a way to collect data for your grant search? Um... No, I'm embarrassed to tell you, probably not. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, of course it goes into it goes into our total UDS report, but for that program specifically, no. And I 
I gained um, a great deal of information from what you shared that it's important to do that uh, in order to move forward. You know, and the, the reality is um, this, when you read it, this stuff seems like obvious, like why wouldn't you do an evaluation? But when the reality is uh, most nonprofits, most organizations do not go through an objective process when they're creating programs. It's, uh, yeah. it's something that when you understand your community and you understand what's going on, you just kind of feel it uh, through your conversations with stakeholders and so forth. Uh, these tools, and again, don't let the tools dominate the process. The professionals and the people in the community understand programs the best. What this does is it gives you a, a process to um, think through it in a detailed way. Um, and also really some of the most important, the most important part of this might be the data that you get as far as what the impact will be. Um, if someone came in front of me uh, looking at, at my or at my uh, foundation looking for money um, and they had a program similar to yours, I would be very interested in it. But um, I'd also want to know some data about it, um, you, both the subjective and the objective. And I sure. like to think, I like to separate these two things and think of them, about them separately uh, in sort of a physical way. The objective things, the measuring of um, SROI, the measuring of impact, how many people you impacted and so forth. And you did mention some of those. Uh, that's, I think of it like a scaffolding of your, your data that you'll give or you, that you would provide to funders, your board of directors and so forth. But let's keep it in funders for now. Um, the subjective information, the stories, the details of the community, um, the, uh, the observations of professionals and how it should help is kind of like uh, the building materials that go in there. Um, so they're both integral parts of building an appropriate program. Um, another way to think of it is the objective information like a canvas and the so, so the social and subjective information, the stories as like the color that goes onto the canvas, the painting. Both are integral to creating the art and just like in, uh, in evaluating a partnership, they're integral to designing a program and evaluating. If you have a program, most people learn about this and do this after they created programs and they're thinking in your situation, how do I continue to fund them? And they come right. to a point where, okay, well, there are all these evaluation tools. Unless you're looking for them, they're di it's difficult to know. Um, so it's uh, very possible if you haven't gone through a process like this in creating the program, you absolutely still can evaluate the program. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, be open about that. Uh, the, the narrative of we did this program for this reason and we chose to start using these objective value, evaluate, these validated tools to do it, um, it says a lot about an organization and it says that uh, it says a lot about the integrity of that. So um, even if it's, it's never too late for this. Um, Thank you. So that, that, that would be my recommendation for you and I appreciate you sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah. And Kevin, we have another hand raised by Camille. Uh, we'll do one more. And just FYI, uh, I love talking about this stuff. I, mm -hmm. I put my cell number and my um, uh, my email in the next thing, in the next slide. Uh, if, you're, if you want to talk through something, please give me a call. I'd be happy to uh, share insight of other centers and what they've done or best practices that I'm aware mm -hmm. of that may be appropriate for you. Uh, go ahead, Fide. Sorry. Mm -hmm. All right, Camille. There we go. I'm now unmuted. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Camila Noel Hunter, and I am from the Council of Large Public Housing Authorities, uh, which is a member association of PHAs. So um, I'm the health policy manager, and we at CLAFA have a joint initiative with United Healthcare to incubate um, partnerships between PHAs and FQHCs. Um, so we call it the Catalyst Initiative, and we have 10 sites across the country where we are bringing together um, PHAs with um, federally qualified health centers and then other community-based organizations. Uh, a couple of the key factors of this is doing trying to look at data sharing and data across our organizations, looking at common goals, and then to come up with some sort of plan or initiative to work together on a common goal. Um, so we have 10 sites, as I mentioned, we're working in Akron, Ohio, uh, Columbus, Ohio, Detroit, Michigan, 
um, Memphis, Houston, Austin, um, I'm making sure I have my whole list, Indianapolis, Atlanta, and New Orleans. I think that was all 10. Um, and so far, we're kind of right in the launch of initiatives phase as we've been doing partnership development over the past year and a half. Um, so I was really interested in your presentation because um, we you know we've been developing our evaluation plans as the evaluate as the interventions are kind of getting formed. And what I'm really interested in is looking at how do we measure and um, report on the value of the partnership building um, at, alongside those like more tangible health outcomes of attitudes, behavior changes, and um, you know measurable health changes. Um, so. If you have any questions, I'm happy to share more. Yeah, I do. Um, so um, my understanding of, of some of the uh, technologies that United Health is uh, is putting forward is they have a lot of new encryption um, technologies that allow more fluid uh, HIPAA compliant data sharing. Um, is that something that you've run into that there are that that's either an issue or that there are any new technologies or systems that allow you to allow e EHR data to be shared or e any HIPAA uh, uh, data to be shared? Yeah, so unfortunately, I'm not the expert on the HIPAA data um, at the moment, uh, so I can't really tell you, um, but I know data sharing is something we're digging into, particularly how to put in place the data sharing agreements. Um, also, just as a, a side note, um, we at CLAFA um, are particularly discussing with HUD how to get more, um, so it will be HUD and HHS, but how to get more direction on what data sharing should look like between PHAs and FQHCs and other healthcare partners. Um, just because we, we know many of our PHAs have FQHC partners that they data share with or with education partners or whatnot, and we know in generally that HUD gives a nod of approval, but they won't, they have yet to come out and give a public statement about what is allowed and what isn't allowed. Um, so we're looking for some direction from the federal agencies uh, to give some more information about what, what that should look like um, across our organizations. So that's a difficult one, Camille. Yes. Um, and not just the current landscape is incredibly complex. Uh, and a lot of these are relatively emerging technologies and mm -hmm. what's actually used to data share. Um, I have your email. I'm gonna send you a report that I, uh, that I have on some of the emerging technologies in encryption and blockchain um, right. that are uh, being implemented in some of the largest healthcare uh, systems, uh, primarily like HCA and so forth. Um, there are some new encryption techniques that are coming down the pipeline and should be available in the market in the next couple of years that may totally change the way that we do this and, and make it HIPAA compliant data sharing much easier te mm. technologically by using um, uh, some very complicated uh, mathematics that I can neither understand nor mm. explain. Uh, we have a report that does so, um, and I'd love to send it your way. And I also would love to ask you some questions, if that's okay, uh, via email. I have your sure, email. yes. And you know, uh, just on the front side of that, outside of the technology, um, part of it is just getting people comfortable with the idea. Um, so I do a lot of the conversations of like, yes, PFJs and FQHCs can share data, you know, um, that this is something we can do, and what's the value of that? Um, so there's there's the human aspect as well of um, getting people ready to do data sharing and how to use it. Mm. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate your, your insight. Yes, um, thank and you. I think we nailed it with time, Fide. Yes, um, we did. So uh, if you could go to the, the thank you slide with my, my contact information, please. Mm -hmm. um, so that's me. Um, uh, feel free. Uh, and I'd be happy to hear from all of you. Um, and thank you so much for your time and concern and thank you for your service to your communities. Uh, I'm very excited from what I've heard and uh, I appreciate all the details. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And just one kind of reminder before leaving, um, please fill out our, our post-evaluation survey. 
um, that will be really helpful for us. Thank you so much.